like to welcome you to this fourth of six panels in the Hoover Institution's annual conference on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. My name is Glenn Tiffert, the manager of Hoover's project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. We have an outstanding program ahead today on the theme of PRC influence and interference. As many of you know, this is a subject that has sparked tremendous concern in many countries around the world, where some of the tactics that the Chinese Communist Party has refined at home to dominate public opinion and control information and to silence or marginalize critics collide against the values of pluralism and tolerance that liberal democracies in particular strive to practice. The CCP exploits the openness of free societies while vigorously policing its own domain. This is one of the most extreme asymmetries in a relationship plagued by asymmetries. The CCP cultivates influential allies abroad, incentivizing them to align their interest with its own so that in time they come to echo its talking points, either wittingly or unwittingly. Towards those beyond the reach of its blandishments, it directs economic, social, and political pressure and outright threats. Over the past year, we have seen increasingly strident examples of China's wolf warrior diplomacy. Just last week, the PRC's ambassador to Canada publicly warned the Canadian government that granting asylum to activists from Hong Kong could have consequences for the health and safety of the 300,000 Canadians living in Hong Kong. A week before that, two officials from the PRC embassy in Fiji crashed a local event sponsored by Taiwan's government and began filming and taking pictures of the attendees. After they were asked to leave, they beat a Taiwanese representative so badly he was hospitalized. These are just some of the most egregious public examples, but a universe of other more subtle influence and interference activities, what we call sharp power, lurk in the shadows. Often covert, coercive, or corrupting, these lie beyond the norms of ordinary soft power and diplomacy and aim to reshape our information space and perceptions so that we come to see the world as the CCP would like us to. I dare say that the Hoover Institution has been an active contributor to the discussion on these matters. This past summer, our project on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific region released a report in partnership with the Stanford Internet Observatory that analyzed China's information war warfare operations abroad with respect to Hong Kong, the 2020 Taiwan election, and the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our project on China's global sharp power released a report on the risks to national security and research integrity that academic collaboration with China can pose, particularly when it involves Chinese institutions and scholars that have close yet poorly understood and even concealed ties to China's military. But for us, at least, the project that started it all was a seminal 2018 report edited by Hoover Senior Fellow Larry Diamond and the Asia Society's Orville Shell, in which an all-star cast of scholars and analysts, including our discussant today, John Pomfret, explored China's undue influence operations across various sectors in the United States. I refer you to hoover.org to learn more about all of this work. One other participant in the working group that generated that 2018 report deserves special mention, Anne-Marie Brady of the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. More than almost anyone else, Professor Brady has put the subject of PRC influence and interference urgently on the map, and her scholarship has opened the eyes of a global community of scholars and policymakers. But exposing problematic relationships, asking inconvenient questions, and unraveling the web of interests that tie powerful institutions and individuals in our own countries to China comes with risk, both personal and professional. The leadership of this project wishes to say that it stands with Professor Brady, draws inspiration from her, and counts her as a friend and esteemed colleague. As a final note before turning to our panelists, I think it is vital to point out that no one experiences the push pull and pressures of PRC influence and interference, and the debates about how to respond more than overseas Chinese. Whether short-term visitors, recent immigrants, or citizens with roots that go back multiple generations in a given country, the ethnic Chinese diaspora is a marvelously vibrant and diverse set of communities. The Chinese Communist Party would have us believe that it speaks for them all. Today's panel demonstrates that it manifest, manifestly does not. 
As we grapple with how to respond to PRC influence and interference, it is incumbent on liberal democracies to practice equity and tolerance, to respect the diversity of our Chinese communities, and to learn from and partner with them to preserve and live up to the fundamental values and freedoms we hold dear. Now, I've gone on long enough, so let me turn to our guests today. Our discussant, John Pomfret, is global affairs contributor and former Beijing bureau chief for the Washington Post. John is among the most informed and incis incisive writers on China anywhere. And I invite you to discover that for yourself by reading his recent book, The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom, America and China 1776 to the Present. Our panelists today are Miss Marie Ma is general manager of Vision Times Media, a leading independent Chinese language media company in Australia. Dr. Puma Shun is assistant professor at National Taipei University's Graduate School of Criminology and director of DoubleThink Labs, which studies the intersection between democratic governance and the internet. And Dr. Yun Han Chu is a distinguished research fellow at the Institute of Political Science at Academia Sinica and Professor of Political Science at National Taiwan University. He serves concurrently as president of the Jiang Jingguo Foundation for International Scholarly Exchange, and his research focuses on the politics of greater China, East Asian political economy, and democratization. I invite everyone in our audience uh, to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will reserve questions for the final 10 or 15 minutes of our panel. Right now, I would like to turn to our next speaker, Ms. Marie Ma, who will give us an insight into the evolving space for diaspora media in Australia. Um, thank you to the Hoover team for inviting me to participate and very privileged to be speaking amongst the experts here on this panel. Um, I'll be mainly giving some practical examples of how the Chinese embassy and consulates here in Australia um, conducts influence operations in the Chinese community through the local Chinese language media, both uh, traditional and social media on WeChat. Um, initially over 20 to 30 years ago, um, the Chinese media in Australia were all quite independently established and, and have very minimal influence from the Chinese government. Uh, we had newspapers established by um, different uh, migrant waves. Um, the, the earliest were those from Hong Kong and Taiwan and later on from mainland China. Now, most Chinese media at the time were quite critical of the Chinese government, especially after the Tiananmen Square massacre. Um, in fact, one of Australia's um, oldest Chinese language newspaper at that time was, um, uh, which was initially um, established by Chinese students from the mainland, actually, um, they, they led the discussion on Tiananmen Square massacre, democratic change in China, and act as a, a platform for Chinese students to get their voices across to the Bob Hawke government at the time. The Australian government then issued humanitarian pr protection for all the Chinese students here in Australia that, um, in 1989. However, unfortunately, about <clears throat> 10 or so years later, this newspaper started to engage in self-censorship and became a mouthpiece for the Chinese consulate up until quite recently after the Australia um, government introduced the foreign interference laws, which I'll touch on a bit later. Um, now, similar things happened to a Chinese radio station where the original person in charge was actually swapped for someone less critical of the Chinese government's actions. I'll talk about the types of coercions that people involved in the Chinese lead, uh, in the Chinese language media landscape has come under over the past decade or so. As this talk is public, I will have to suppress some of the details as such as out, outlet names and personal details, but I'll keep the essentials of what happened. Um, much of what I summarize below are from an anecdotal and first person accounts. Um, it happened to a range of media outlets in Australia and in New Zealand. Um, the situation, as I understand it, it, was not unique to Australia or New Zealand. In fact, I think Taiwan is one of the places where interference into the media was especially severe. But I'll leave that to the actual um, experts on this panel to touch upon if they want later. Um, so. I guess the types of um, coercion that we've come across um, within the media landscape here in Australia is um, um, they, uh, 
actively intimidating advertisers. Um, there was a case where they had a tea chat with one of them at the Chinese consulate. And when the client refused to pull their ad from a certain um, media company. And another example was um, to actually pay visits to clients um, or client partners offices in China, asking them to pull advertising from specified media outlets in Australia. Um, Another method was putting pressure on investors or owners of independent media so that their editors will refrain from reporting on sensitive topics unless it is in line with the CCP narrative or else they will be shut out from all official Chinese government events or media conferences. Um, one type of meddling in um, an article was, um, this is one of my favorite, where one contributor actually had the word Zhonggong in his article, which means the Chinese Communist Party, but the editor actually changed it to Zhongguo, to China, so that the article seems to be criticizing China instead of directly at the Chinese Communist Party. So it may seem quite petty, that little change, but it goes a long way um, in conflating the concepts that China and CCP are the sort of the same thing, so that if anyone who is seeing as criticizing the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, will seem like they're racist. Um, yeah, so another method was requesting Chinese Australian or New Zealand businesses not to advertise in certain Chinese media outlets if they still want to maintain good relations with China when doing their business, um, hence driving some media outlets to bankruptcy. Um, Another method is putting indirect pressure on investors um, or owners of independent media outlets by threatening their relatives in China and their other affiliated organizations. Um, actively threatening distribution locations to remove copies of printed media or actually stealing printed, um, printed publications was a common method that's used. Um, another method was applying pressure through local government councillors who are friendly with the Chinese consulate to not give presence to media outlets that they don't like at community events. Um, there's also shutting down of media presence on Chinese government controlled platforms such as WeChat and Weibo. So this sort of brings me to WeChat. Um, since June 2017, the office of the uh, the central leading group for cyberspace affairs has banned WeChat platforms from publishing news unless the chief editor is a Chinese citizen and also registered in China. Um, WeChat, as everyone knows, is a highly censored environment. So in order to maintain the survival um, on these platforms, people have really have no choice but to toe the party line or actually disengage from any types of political discussions. Uh, most political discussion groups are monitored and shut down with the reason that, you know, they violated group rules. And um, WeChat is the biggest, um, you know, media, biggest media. And this is where United Front uh, works their magic and really flies under the radar of a lot of Western de demo uh, democracies. Uh, most people only know about, you know, disinformation and fake news, how they spread on WeChat but it is really important to see how it actually spreads information to effectively mo mobilize the Chinese community to support particular political policies or people. Um, now WeChat groups, they're capped at 500 people each for a group. United Front organizations in Australia um, each have many of these groups. Some of them have you know, up to 50 of such groups with 500 people in each. So you can do the maths on that one. Um, so normally these groups are quite dormant, um, not much happens with posts about, you know, where to eat, where to go for holidays, what school to pick for your kids. But when critical matters come up, information can really spread very quickly through these groups. Um, so this can happen during elections or used to target certain politicians. Um, there was one Chinese Australian politician here in Australia, which made initial supportive comments about Hong Kong. There was a sudden spike in negative posts about her being circulated in WeChat groups. And this acted as a warning to her that, look, United Front efforts can help her win her position, but 
can also take it away from her if she went out of line. Um, United, Front, uh, United Front groups can also organise rallies within a very short space of time by spreading quite jingoistic and often one-sided misinformation through these groups and other voices are usually unheard or disappeared. Um, time and time again, um, Chinese diaspora's thoughts and views are, you know, are often shaped by what's on spread on WeChat. And a lot of these views are not in favor of Western governments, especially when it comes to discussing matters of racial discrimination. Um, this counters much of the effort that Western governments like Australia have made to reach out to the Chinese communities. Um, United Front organization leaders actually use WeChat groups to get funding from the Chinese consulate because the more groups they have, it means the more influence they have or more powerful they are. They use these groups as their assets. And um, yeah, so it really shows how important WeChat is for United Front efforts. Um, and so the, in reality, to win the sort of the media narrative, the, the actual narrative, Western democracies will not only have to strengthen independent overseas um, traditional Chinese language media, but also work out a way how to on how to regulate and circumvent um, WeChat, uh, where a lot of the United Front works occur. Um, here in Australia in 2018, the government introduced a set of foreign influence transparency laws. Now, these laws did not occur overnight. It was a steady culmination of um, actual interference, both overt and covert, that was happening to many Australians that prompted the Australian government to act. It certainly um, did not just target China, but with the different values that we have to China, there are certainly more notable cases of interference which came to light. And I think um, the foreign interference laws that was introduced by the Australian government probably was one of the best things that has happened to our community here because what it has done is empowered the Chinese people to speak up and to open up the debate within the community about these underlying issues. Um, at the time, I recall, we received a lot of submissions and opinion pieces and the whole community was quite fired up. It was really great, actually, um, and certainly a very polarised debate. Um, so, yeah, so it was um, quite similar to what was happening in the Australian mainstream. Uh, many Chinese were antagonistic towards the laws and many were applaud applauding the laws and very supportive. So the good news is since the introduction of the foreign interference transparency um, laws, we saw clearly changes in behavior of people within the community. Um, there are cases where Chinese language media traditionally running the party line started to sort of balance out their reports. Um, there was a, they even had some analysis on the um, Confucius Institutes, which was a topic they probably would not have really covered previously in a very balanced way. I think there was one another case where a newspaper actually um, talked about Zhang Zhixin, who's a um, very famous CCP dissident during the Cultural Revolution. Um, and also community leaders became more subdued in the flaunting their connections with the consulate. Um, but of course, they would have gone a bit more under the table, like what James mentioned just then. Um, so I guess it brings me back to the importance of keeping Chinese media independent. We need Chinese language media to keep the conversation robust within the community and Chinese people, especially first generations, they generally feel quite left out. They are like sort of stuck between two worlds. So for Chinese media, it is always uh, like, yeah, unfortunately for Chinese media, it is always safer to run critical articles of Western governments than that of the Chinese government. So you do end up reading a lot more negative things about Western governments. So that defeats a lot of the efforts um, Western governments like Australia put in into fostering uh, multiculturalism and diversity. Um, yeah, so that's all I have at the moment. Um, can answer any questions later on. And I look forward to other, um, other speakers as well. 
Thank you, Marie, for that wonderful overview of the evolving language, uh, Chinese language media space in Australia. Australia, in many ways, has been a leader in, in this regard in sensitizing us to the issues involved. And its um, new foreign interference regulation has been critical. I'm happy to see that there are some bright spots involved. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Puma Shen. Uh, Dr. Shen uh, has been a pathbreaker and is one of Taiwan's leading analysts of the PRC's activities in online disinformation and propaganda. And uh, so we look forward to his remarks in that space as well. Thank you, Dr. Shen. All right. So thanks for organizing all this. And it's really my pleasure to present with all these speakers. So I'm using PowerPoint today because I think it will be much easier for us to understand Chinese disinformation here in Taiwan. So everyone knows that Taiwan is uniquely positioned to provide the insights into China developing strategies and objectives. So we as an organization, Double Think Lab, we're going to release a report on Saturday. So if you read it, you'll get more understanding on how Chinese disinformation evolved like along the road. So we have archived like Chinese media, Weibo, WeChat data every two hours, and also all the Taiwanese media, including a platform like Facebook, YouTube, stuff like that. So in order to look at the high and low ends of its online use regarding different topics to see where the trends are connected to their propaganda or policy documents and link attacks around the world. So based on the data, I propose a model that brings together different actors and most of China's information operation. So before we delve into the uh, issues of information operation. I think there are like four critical questions that needs to be answered. First is like, who are the attackers? And through what channels do they attack the most? And what content do they create? And who are the consumers of this information? So as you can see there on the screen, uh, there are like four passcode over there. It looks like the passcode on your cell phone, but it means that there are like five different attackers there in China. And there are like four different modes of attack modes and eight different content that they created during the election uh, this January uh, 2020. And also there are four different kinds of personality that would like to consume all these kinds of disinformation and share this disinformation to Taiwanese people. So I'll first talk about the adversary. So during Taiwan's 2020 presidential election, there were countless disseminators of this information residing in both China and Taiwan. So in addition to politically oriented manufacturers and distributors, there were a large number of actors driven by financial interests, cooperating with others in a decentralized pattern. So a significant difference between Chinese and Russian information warfare is that the CCP owns many information operation units, as you can see on the screen, and is used to outsourcing its missions. It is less organized than organizations like the IRA. So as illustrated below, actors are placed into the coordinated plan that specifies its correlation with capital and motive, while the goal between agents varies from case to case. So attackers would be driven by political interest on the left or the economic interest on the right, while disseminators are stirred by capital owners or suitors. So in the upper left corner are the entities that own capital and have strong political motivation to produce and spread this information, including the MSS, the PLA, United Front Work Department, as our panelists has already discussed, CPPCC, Propaganda Department, Cyber Police, Taiwan Affairs Office, they do not care about the costs and are willing to create this information that could disturb Taiwan or other nations. These groups seldom directly spread this information and people in Taiwan do not really read their statements either. They determine the pace, the keynote, the rhythm, and the melody by providing other notes or simply setting up propaganda. The real effects are determined by other players in the field. So in the bottom left are players who are capital seekers and have strong political motivations. Local CPCC and the Taiwan Affairs Office, the local Taiwan Affairs Office are the main actors here. They may operate content firms, pay PR firms or marketing groups to disseminate this information, or simply take care of Taiwanese students or businessmen and even professors. In the upper right, 
are companies who simply want to make money. They could be the major distributors since they own capital, and they sometimes produce this information themselves. The contrast to the upper right is the bottom right, people who are not capable of producing this information, but can find a niche they fit in because simply distrib distributing this information is a good business for certain groups of people. So political owners often collaborate with economic owners to distribute this information on mainstream media, while political suitors often look for economic suitors uh, during the gameplay of this information campaign. So for example, the Taiwan Affairs Office works with the one one group closely and local CCPCC may approach influencers online in order to manipulate the online discussion of China-related issues here on our discussion board. However, a political owner, such as United Front Work Department, may approach economic suitors as well if local agencies are involved, and that's the fifth player here. So as an illustration of this, Political owners actually reached out to Taiwanese YouTubers last year with an offer of 50,000 USD dollars per month, asking one of them not to denounce China for six months leading up to the election. With the help of local actors who, um, who try to spread this like Chinese propaganda, more actors in this graph can collaborate with each other with high efficiency. So the attack intensity and the difficulties of investigating information operations are related to two factors here. The China's domestic political tension and the diligence of the local proxy actors. So first, China's international relations and political tensions have changed in the past two years. The CCP has power through its propaganda to promote Chinese nationalism which raises the barrier preventing investigators like us from differentiating patriotism and state-funded actors. Second, proxy actors have actively participated in China's information operation. So even though some attacks are initiated by China, there are many foreign actors who amplify them. It is the proxy actors who connect the actors with the CCP and therefore the intensity of information operation depends on their efforts. And I'll move to the attack modes. So we try to categorize China's, uh, China's information operation into four modes based on attackers' capability and motivation. The, prop the propaganda mode, the pink mode, uh, initiated by Chinese nationalism, the content from mode and collaboration mode. The content from mode and collection mode cause more significant harm than the former. So the first one, the propaganda. The evolution of, of propaganda is very sophisticated. So for example, COVID-19 disinformation tinged with Chinese propaganda was shared by Chinese embassies, Facebook fan pages in Romania and Slovakia, and simultaneously shared by Burma and Vietnam Facebook accounts later circulated into Southeast Asia media as well. And on the other hand, the, China, the Chinese state media like Xinhua, Global Times and Reference News would selectively debunk the disinformation running counter to China's so-called cheerleading narratives. So it means that the China, the China is become the fact checker in Southeast Asia region and try to establish their credit around. And the second mode, the pink mode, is usually an online operation that involves more nativism and is easy to target. It spans from Hong Kong protests to um, like other events here, like the International Airport incident, incident here in Taiwan. So we cannot rule out the connection between trolls and the CCP government. So back in 2000, the CCP published the white paper. It's called China's PLA Prepares for Network Welfare which highlighted the multi-dimensional intrusion, invasion, and scams mostly upheld by trolls and bots. So trolls and bots can be volunteers at first, but they can later be utilized by the CCP. And it can always be observed in several communist youth of league groups and certain Weibo and WeChat public accounts. Overseas Chinese in Vietnam, Cambodia, Singapore, Malaysia, Burma, and the Philippines are influenced by WeChat official accounts and also the public accounts, while their Facebook groups and Twitter accounts are used as the hotbeds 
for disseminating this information. The third one, the content from mode. The fabricators make up the disinformation, need a piece using sensationalized content from news pieces, disseminate the result through chat apps, such as Line or set up related YouTube channels. This is the most complicated mode since multiple players can be involved. The intention of dissemination concerning doctored information from content from websites may be purely commercial, but the likelihood that there are malicious intentions in manipulating public opinion behind the scenes cannot be ruled out either. So there is a complex network of political attackers who are often capital suitors and work within profit driven business. Since the content farm is an adaptive system, echoing China's grand propaganda strategy, content farm patterns have evolved from time to time. There are three significant, three significant characters here. The first one is directly managed by the Chinese actors, or is profit driven uh, by several businesses in Malaysia, or it could be video based on YouTube. They are good at creating junk articles. By producing content from articles, a content from operated by overseas Chinese could upload more than 500 junk articles per day. So students are even paid by overseas Chinese to distribute the disinformation on Facebook. And the reason I know that is because I'm also in that group and try to monitor how they disseminate all this disinformation online. So although starting a direct direct link between the on the authoritarian region coordinated activities, whether on content from websites or YouTube, is difficult and requires greater resource input for further investigation. At this stage of examination, it has been found that there are systematic disseminated pathways stemming from website to Facebook pages, as you can see here in this graph. These are all websites and that try to share all the different disinformation, different piece of disinformation into different IG groups, Facebook groups, or Facebook fan pages. It's very systematic. So at the next stage of our research, we will focus on the strings attached to content from like YouTube videos and their relationship with China and how Chinese propaganda is distributed through the framing efforts. So back to the fourth mode. So the fourth mode is collaboration mode. It's one of the most demanding challenges yet to be conquered. The manufacturers and the distributors are not only synchronized with each other, but they also mirror each other. Agents cannot be identified with ease while subtextual information is embedded between the lines. So it, it is also difficult to attribute attacks in the mode in this mode because China itself is neither the creator nor the distributor of this information. So, for example, an article involving COVID-19 fake news published in a Malaysia pro-China newspaper was first distributed in Taiwan by gangsters that do business in China. And recently, we found evidence that. Chinese mobile game apps not only steal private, inform, in private information overseas, but also manipulate opinions on political talk shows in Taiwan. This also happened last year in Taiwan during the election, while gaming live streamers distribute this information from WeChat simultaneously, and which is a really perfect example of this collaboration. And now I'll move to the content that they create. So specific narratives have dominated the 2020 Taiwan presidential election campaign, such as democracy is a failure, which supports the view that democracy in Taiwan has failed. The narrative democracy is a failure has stretched from the presidential election campaign to right now the COVID-19 epidemic. There are seven more topics here, as you can see on the screen that have been mentioned during the election. But if we put all these messages in the temporal order, we see the themes and narratives are rather scattered, as you can see on the left of the screen, and which speaks to the signature of the decentralization I just mentioned. Different players generating and disseminating different topics, and it is our work to sort them out in the future. So we have several stages here, but I, I don't think we have enough time to elaborate. But it means that there are so many actors involved and so many modes involved. And you can see how it's scattered like during the time. 
So one thing worth mentioning here is that we know that China aims at propagandizing its governance model and values. So in other words, that China's model is better than Western democracy. However, unlike the view that China's cyber army is only cheerleading, we must consider that China's information operations are also negative and aggressive. And furthermore, many conspiracy themes are involved. They amplify the discord, criticize certain ideologies, and fabricate conspiracies. And I'll move to the last part, the consumer. So this method is, is to, to address the victims who consume the disinformation often in Taiwan. And we did an exit poll and online survey and using some technology to let, collect information and also conducting an experiment to see whether people are affected by certain fake news or disinformation here in Taiwan. So according to our study, those who are prone to consuming disinformation are made up of four different personalities. So if you are very really interested in that, we're, we're going to release the report on Saturday, but maybe we can talk about that during the Q&A as well. So when this information that triggers negative emo uh, emotions is circulated frequently in chat apps or by word of mouth among people with a specific political affiliation, it has more impact than this information being widely discussed in the mainstream media. So let's say, what is disturbing here is that what we previously, previously we thought extremists are the ones who are deeply affected by this information, such as conspiracy theories. However, according to our study, people who claim to be neutral and apolitical are affected more than others. This aligns with CCP's United Front Org, as it's not approaching extremists since they will approach China voluntarily. So instead, it's about the people who are apolitical as they are vulnerable to United Front Org. So based on our research, we propose several possible regulatory action that may help to minimize the effects of uh, foreign information operation, including transparency, to blocking the collaboration between the go-between agents, the proxy actors I just mentioned, and some reasonable, ma reasonable ma measures for social media platforms. However, it is a pity that Taiwan failed to successfully pass several legal measures aimed at increasing transparency during the last election period. And Thank you, Dr. Shen. Yeah. Thank you very so, much. Um, we'll pick up your, uh, your conclusions in the discussion, I think, so that we can get on to, uh, to Professor Zhu's uh, remark. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, we have a real treat ahead of us um, because uh, Professor uh, Yunhan Zhu is uh, not only a distinguished professor of political science and affiliated with Academia Seneca, but he's also the director and principal investigator of the Asian Barometer Survey. And he will be giving us some very interesting um, analysis of public perceptions across Asia with respect to China and the United States. Thank you, Professor Zhu. Glenn, uh, thank you for uh, organizing this. Uh, today, I would like to share with you some of the findings from our most recent uh, survey. Uh, this is uh, based on a paper I uh, caused with uh, Professor Minghua Huang, uh, my colleague at National Taiwan University. Uh, basically, we are looking at uh, what shape uh, people's view toward China. Uh, across Asia. Uh, we are using uh, what uh, social scientists call the pseudo panel analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into the statistical detail, but just try to summarize the, uh, the more interesting finding from our survey. Next, please. Yeah. Um, we, we try to identify um, uh, what uh, uh, have driven the changes in the perception uh, toward China. Because we observed that since uh, Xi Jinping came to power, actually um, the favorable uh, view of China has, uh, I would say, have declined in a lot of places in Asia. As, but at the same time, China has, all, has uh, uh, invested a lot uh, in terms of uh, how to prop, prop up its uh, national image through all kinds of uh, public diplomacy effort. So in a way that the more mm -hmm. assertive, more uh, aggressive and more ambitious foreign policy agenda and the play of hard power 
has actually compromised uh, its own effort uh, to improve its over image abroad. Um, and so empirically, we, we try to, uh, to dig uh, uh, you know, deeper into this underlying dynamic. Um, and also we would like to know what other factors, uh, long running factors such as ideology, uh, economic consideration, uh, also uh, have the impact on uh, how it shaped people's view toward China. And finally, that since our data uh, cover not just the uh, leadership transition from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, but also uh, between our fourth wave uh, and our fifth wave survey, we also uh, coincide, our survey data coincided with the transition from Obama to Donald Trump. Uh, because, oh, you know, United States always uh, a, a fierce competitor uh, over uh, uh, soft power in the region vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So this is also very important background uh, information that we, uh, we would like to look into as well. Uh, next slide. So basically, um, we try to identify uh, what are the plausible explaining sources for the frustration uh, of perception over time? Um, so uh, these are the, uh, the plausible uh, uh, reason. One is that whether um, the, the uh, pursue a more ambitious assertive policy on the Xi, you know, uh, might uh, uh, have its impact. And secondly, it's the exercise of hard power, especially a uh, country that uh, have ongoing ter territorial dispute with China, uh, especially after 2013, uh, China have built up a uh, substantial uh, artificial reef uh, in the China Sea um, and to exert its uh, sovereign claim. And this obviously have escalated the tension uh, and, and, and a, a similar Development, you know, you can uh, say about the uh, East China Sea, uh, where the Diao Yutai uh, or Sinkaku dispute uh, between China and Japan also have uh, escalated for a while uh, during the uh, around 2015 and 16. And there are other factors coming to play, like uh, whether how people uh, view uh, the uh, the benef beneficiary impact of globalization, or actually uh, they are more protectionist. Uh, that kind of uh, economic uh, attitude, whether that will also shape people's view toward China, but because China, uh, on one hand, uh, it's a uh, present opportunity, but also it poses uh, 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 threat, uh, competitive pressure uh, on to its neighbor. And also we look at um, uh, how people, you know, their own view about their own economic situation um, and their view on their country macroeconomic situation, whether that also would have impact on their perception. And then come to political um, factors, such as whether uh, if they view China as less democratic than their own country, or they view uh, a huge gap between uh, level of democracy between China and the United States, whether that will give an edge to US self power, or it will, uh, on the other hand, dampen uh, uh, their uh, positive view toward China. Uh, and, and also, uh, what also matters uh, is that whether people who embrace liberal democratic value more strongly then um, they will be uh, uh, more wary of uh, the growing influence of China. On the other hand, the people uh, who are more authoritarian uh, in their own political orientation, they, they don't uh, actually mind that much. Actually, they might welcome uh, the growing Chinese influence. And, and finally, uh, whether um, the perception that China has been objectively uh, much stronger and more influential, then that might generate some kind of bandwagon effect. 
so which means that if you can be China, you just join it. Okay, so this is uh, another more kind of pra pragmatic thinking behind people uh, uh, calculation. Uh, let me jump to our major finding, you know, before I go into uh, uh, slightly uh, more, uh, provide you more detail. Number one, we found that the escalation of the terror, terror dispute, especially in China Sea, uh, have uh, dragged down, have dragged down substantially uh, positive view toward China, uh, uh, especially among the populace in a uh, country like Vietnam, the Philippines, uh, you know, country that uh, which are claimant uh, to this dispute. And, and also we found that political value do matter. Uh, people who embrace more liberal democratic value, uh, they are more on guard uh, with the growing Chinese influence. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, if they care more about uh, the democratic advantage their own system enjoy uh, over China, then also uh, that will also dampen um, uh, their uh, uh, policy view toward China. So this is very important uh, matter. Um, but, but at the same time, I have to point out that um, with the uh, Donald Trump uh, took, taking over uh, the steering wheel, then there is a structural change. Uh, in the past that if people who believe that uh, American system is much more democratic than China, then it usually uh, will uh, actually erode uh, their uh, favorable view toward China. But once Trump um, uh, took power, that uh, democratic edge you know, actually disappeared uh, in our model. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is uh, 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 more uh, audience in the Asian region actually are perceptive to the Chinese model. Uh, and once they identify the Chinese model uh, could be a benchmark for the country own development in the future, then uh, they tend to, that tend to reinforce their favorable view toward China. So this is the a general finding that uh, we have uh, discovered. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and we, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, do our analysis on the basis of Asian Brown Survey, which covered the entire region. Uh, every three or two, uh, three to four years, we conduct face-to-face -face, uh, survey on uh, based on probability sampling. Uh, so our data, we believe, you know, the quality is very high, it's very reliable. And actually, this is probably the only source of data that you can have if you want to cover the entire region. The Pew survey uh, also conduct uh, thermometer uh, uh, measures on uh, China and United States from time to time. But Usually in Asia, they only cover Japan and uh, South Korea. Occasionally they cover Indonesia uh, and that's about it. Yeah, so this is uh, Asian Flower Survey actually feel a very important void, yeah, in terms of empirical data. Next, yeah, this is a survey schedule. Um, uh, so we draw our, uh, the data from our wave three, wave four and wave uh, uh, five. And as you can see there, we cover almost the entire region except for North Korea, uh, Laos. Um, and and we, we have collect data on uh, uh, perception toward China and United States since uh, wave three. Uh, and you can see that during wave three uh, in China is still a Hu Jintao era. Uh, that's more than 10 years ago. Uh, but then between wave three and wave four, you, you have the uh, 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 power transition from Hu and uh, to Xi Jinping. And, and, and interesting uh, that between wave four and wave five, uh, wave five, you know, uh, it uh, took place uh, in most in most cases, uh, 2019, this is already uh, Donald Trump era. So you can also do a comparison uh, between Obama era and, and Donald Trump. Uh, next slide. Okay, 
So let me give you some uh, overall picture. Okay, this is a question about which country has the most influence in Asia at present. Okay, this is not about uh, assessment uh, or uh, value uh, judgment. It's just more uh, kind of perception. Okay, which country is more influential in the region? Uh, I have to say that uh, overwhelmingly, uh, uh, great majority uh, Asian, they already recognize China has been more influential than the United States, okay. Um, uh, and you can uh, uh, classify the Asian country uh, into two groups. Basically, uh, the first group is countries that are geographically adjacent to China or uh, hold a very strong commercial and cultural tie with China. Uh, countries like uh, you know, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Mongolia, Vietnam, Japan, uh, and, and you might also include uh, Singapore. Uh, in these countries, uh, uh, the, the influence of China has been uh, keenly felt a long time ago, you know, even before Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping uh, uh, came to power. And they reached a plateau actually uh, about, about 10 years ago uh, and have fluctuated a little bit, but not much uh, over time. Uh, and then uh, you have countries that are farther away from China, uh, like Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines. Okay, and then you can see, you know, there's a substantial increase of potential people who identify China as more influential uh, than the United States of, o over the last uh, uh, 10 years. Um, uh, the only country where uh, there are still, uh, you know, um, uh, slightly more people who recognize United States as more influential is uh, what we found is in India, actually. But India, uh, most Indian, as a matter of fact, identify India itself as the most influential. So, so that is a, just a trivial point. Uh, uh, next slide, okay. Next slide, okay. So, uh, but even though people have already, already recognized that uh, China has been uh, very influential, more influential than the United States in the region, but whether they welcome that, uh, and how they evaluate whether you know China uh, impact on the region uh, you know is beneficiary or it's harmful. Okay, uh, this chart shows you the percent of our respondents who say either United States or China, you know their role in in the region is more uh, uh, beneficial. Okay, so they do more uh, good than harm. This is percentage. So on this score, actually, United States still maintains some compared to edge over China. Uh, 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 in most country, we observe that there are many more uh, respondents identify US influence as positive or beneficiary, uh, more so uh, than uh, uh, you know, their perception about China. Uh, China has the lowest, you know, the least favorable view uh, in countries like Japan, Vietnam, uh, Mongolia. Um, and Myanmar as well, okay. Uh, however, there are some subtle changes here. On the one hand, um, countries that are involved uh, in the South China Sea uh, dispute, uh, uh, the, their favorable perception of China has, uh, have, have gone down considerably. You know, that, look what happened in Vietnam uh, and look what happened in the Philippines. Uh, but same time, I have to say Donald Trump didn't uh, fare any better. Um, um, you know, his uh, turn to unilateralism and transactional politics uh, have dampened the favorable view uh, towards the United States in quite a few important allies uh, of the United States, like uh, say uh, in Singapore, uh, from 80% to 42%. That's a 38 percentage point drop. Uh, even Japan from 79 to 56, that's also quite dramatic. Uh, and, and even in Taiwan as well, a uh, nine uh, percentage point drop and also Korea, uh, is 16 point, uh, percentage point. So however, I would say, uh, 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 you, 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 United States still enjoy a floor support, okay? A reservoir of support, okay? Um, so maybe, you know, the. I don't know if uh, 
Joe Biden get elected, you know, he might be able to uh, uh, reverse this, uh, this, this trend and, and we, we uh, uh, furbish uh, US uh, 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 soul power in, in region. Final slide, my final slide, and I will conclude, yeah. So it's, uh, I skip all the, uh, uh, the statistical uh, table, just jump to this uh, quick conclusion. Uh, so basically, uh, you can say that, uh, uh, what are the most important factors shaping people's view toward China? I would say um, China uh, approach, foreign policy has been conflicting and contradictory in many ways. It's, it's, uh, it probably have compromised on public diplomacy effort over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, so Xi Jinping, his more uh, assertive uh, foreign policy, more ambitious agenda actually have dampened support uh, by as much as uh, 17%, okay? And, and, and then uh, it's a tough approach to the South China Sea also again have some dampening effect. Um, however, economic uh, factor is more a mixed one. Uh, sometimes it helps Chinese uh, 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 favorable to what you toward China, sometimes it you know, will, will undermine. But generally, I was generally speaking, if you use this data uh, more precisely, you would argue that for people in Asia, if they feel that their own economy, the country economy is doing well, but their, but their own income uh, is not sufficient to su sustain their uh, uh, decent life, then these are the group which are least favorable toward China. So it's a sense of deprivation, okay? Um, and finally, I think uh, political values still really matter. Um, as you can see there, uh, you know, this liberal democratic, uh, uh, democratic attitude. For people who subscribe strongly to this value, then uh, they are very unlikely to perceive um, uh, China favorably, okay? But at the same time, there's another uh, current we have to be aware of. That's to say, in some part of Asia, there are more people identify Chinese model, okay, as a reference, as a benchmark. Once they do that, then it will enhance, it will compromise uh, the, uh, the the dampening effect I just described. You know, uh, you know about this liberal democratic uh, value. Uh, so this is a, a very tricky, you know, development. That's something we should pay much attention to in the future. I stop right here. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Ju, for an exceptionally rich paper and very rich discussion, which I'm sure will provide ample grist for our conversation. Um, before moving on to our discussion, I'd like to remind our audience to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. And now I turn it over to John Pomfret. So let's start by thanking both Larry Diamond and Glenn Tiffert for inviting me to be a discussant on this panel. It was a pleasure to read all these papers and I would commend actually all, the, all of them to you in the audience. I'd like to speak to some of the broader themes and questions raised by these papers as, as a whole. These papers, as you know, broadly focus on PRC influence campaigns and the success or failure of its global publicity outreach. The papers focus on PRC activities in Taiwan, Australia, and elsewhere. And if I could be asked for my, what my main takeaway from all these papers was as we ponder how to grapple with Chinese influence operations, it's that the best way to counter these efforts would be transparency, transparency, and actually more transparency. And to that, I'd add three suggestions. And one would be the necessity of considering ways to better res support research and reporting on Chinese influence operations. Secondly, the necessity of perhaps considering how to subsidize independent Chinese language media to better reach the Chinese diaspora and to tell a different story. And thirdly, to consider legislation to counter Chinese state-led propaganda efforts to sell its story around the world. So let me take the papers one by one. Puma Shun's paper, it really provides a detailed analysis of, of the players involved in the PRC's efforts to sow division, for example, in, in, in Puma's case in Taiwan. Shen's paper really gave me a sense of the complexity of and the, and the different interests, both economic, political, and both that motivate the players in the business of Chinese propaganda. 
Puma draws connections between, for example, state-owned actors like the Taiwan Affairs Office in Beijing and organized criminal operations in Taiwan, between individual hackers and local affiliates of the Chinese People's Co Political Consultative Congress. So in Puma's paper, we really better understand the complex ecosystem that supports, benefits from, and magnifies Chinese propaganda. What I like best about the paper, and I would like to see more of, and, and Marie's pro, pre, Marie Ma's presentations come to mind here, are specific examples of how Chinese propaganda activity works, such as a deeper investigation into the connections, for example, between Want Want Media in Taiwan and the United Front or Taiwan Affairs Office in Beijing, or the Taiwanese YouTuber who has offered cash to stop criticizing China. Again, transparency and sunlight on these issues, and that's in essence shaming China. And this, this goes back to something that Liz Economy mentioned in a previous panel, but shaming China and also shaming the beneficiaries of China's propaganda campaign could, ser could serve as a useful lever to modify Chinese behavior. And also just as important as a tool to educate and raise awareness among the consumers of Chinese media, both in Taiwan and around the world. So the similar uh, idea holds true for Marie Ma's paper on Chinese language media landscape in Australia. She describes in her paper what she calls the sad reality of Chinese language media in Australia as having been almost completely harmonized by PRC propaganda efforts, either for economic reasons, right? Chinese state-owned enterprises are big advertisers in Australian Chinese language media, and they won't run ads in papers that aren't that are independent of PRC control or for ideological reasons or because the owners of these papers have been threatened or bullied by PRC representatives. So 30 years ago, as, as, as Marie noted, the Chinese language media landscape in Australia was far different. It was much more sort of normal, if you will, or, or, or free flowing. And the Chinese language media led discussions on things like Tiananmen Square, the crackdown and provided an outlet for Chinese students to have their voices heard, but that's not the case today. And it's important to note that this sad reality of which Ma writes stretches far beyond Australia's border. We see, we see that sad reality in the United States where now the majority of the Chinese language papers, generally speaking, toe the communist party line. Yes, there are independent sources of news in the Chinese language space in the United States. Vision Times, for example, Marie Ma's paper in Australia publishes a sister paper in the United States, but these outlets are few and far between. And so much so that, that even papers that had been associated with the nationalist regime in Taiwan have seen their editorial content bend towards Beijing, partially because they too look for business opportunities in China and also ads from pro-Chinese or PRC owned companies. The US has also seen the, also seen the rise of WeChat's influence in America, sort of similar to how WeChat is rising in influence among the Chinese diaspora in Australia. And the issues that reflect the views of the PRC dominate the WeChat, the WeChat narrative in the United States. Now, Marie suggests, and I think this is an important point, that governments interested in countering Chinese propaganda need do, to do more to support independent Chinese language media outlets around the world. And let's be frank about it. A state-owned enterprise from China placing an ad in a pro-PRC newspaper in Australia, that needs to be recognized for what it is. It's a state subsidy to a pro-Beijing media outlet. And transparency would be a key first step in exposing this type of behavior. But legislation could also deal with it. Perhaps it could be useful as well. So I was heartened to hear Marie speak about how following Australia's legislative moves to limit foreign influence, it actually resulted in some Chinese media outlets in Australia at least making a show of being more even-handed. This illustrates how transparency wedded with legislation could result in changes for the better. Now, James Toe has given an eloquent presentation at the key points of his paper about the guiding hand and the subtleties of United Front work. So I'm not gonna repeat that, but a close reading of his paper also leads one to another critical point about how to respond to the hijacking of things Chinese by the PRC. And that's the role of Taiwan. To implies, that, and I agree, that Taiwan's move away from traditional overseas Chinese work and broader engagement with the totality of the ethnic Chinese diaspora 
to favor a more limited focus on Taiwanese identity has, has left the field open for the PRC. So it's not simply that the PRC has bought off, for example, the Chinese language media around the world. It's also that, that Taiwan's decision, because of political changes in Taiwan, to focus on Taiwanese identity overseas has created the conditions where China can dominate the telling of China's story. And I think this is an important point, and it bears repeating. On Taiwan, it's not politically beneficial to be seen as Chinese. But the result of this domestic political reality is that overseas, the CCP no longer has any state-based competitor to the narrative it is seeking to construct and dominate. And it raises the question, how would this situation change if Taiwan re-engaged on this inter issue internationally? Finally, the paper by Yun Han Zhu and Min Minhua Huang reminds us that for all of China's efforts to manipulate public opinion, opinion its track record is mixed. Its soft power is weakening, even as its hard power may be increasing. Even though, as, as Professor Zhu just mentioned in his presentation, there remains an attractiveness, perhaps growing to China's model to some, still a significant con con contribution to China's failure to win hearts and minds is attributed by Professor Zhu and, and his co-writer to the rise of Xi Jinping. Their polling data has show, shown a decrease of 16 to 17% of those rating China favorably since Xi took power in 2012, 2013. And importantly, President Trump and his China's policies don't seem to have played a role in this. So this, this is Xi's mess. Xi Jinping owns this problem. And so in concluding, I was left to wonder, how will this landscape, landscape change or be altered when Xi Jinping inevitably, as he must, the passes from the scene. So with that, I'd like to thank you again for inviting me to participate in this panel and I look forward to a productive discussion. Thank you very much, John, for those incredibly insightful remarks and comments. I'd like to pose a question now um, and give the panel an opportunity to react to John's remarks as well, to, but to pose a question from Larry Diamond, um, who asks uh, our three panelists, uh, to um, react uh, to the data in the Asian survey and the Asian barometer survey and what it says about how China's power, soft power and sharp power in Asia can be countered. And for, for Professor Chu, I would also ask a more specific question and that is your paper ends with a series of recommendations for China. Uh, but in the United States, we are about to have a presidential election. And however it turns out and whatever the result is, what would your data say to guide American policy in the region going forward? Um, thank you. Uh, let me comment on, on you know, what, what uh, the, the future uh, U.S. Uh, administration can do. I, you know, I, 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 on one hand, I agree with John that eventually uh, Xi Jinping you know, will step down, but I, I, I try. But I also I believe that uh, the the uh, leadership transition will take place sooner uh, than uh, the expiration uh, 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 than the uh, when the, uh, the Xi Jinping tenure will expire. Um, I think U U.S. Uh, 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 you know should return to its value-based foreign policy. Uh, it should occupy uh, the more high, higher ground uh, based on the basis of uh, it should play a much more constructive role as an international leader, uh, respect for multilateralism and put uh, human rights and democracy uh, and economic freedom in their own top of, of, of foreign policy agenda. I would say Asian as a whole, they really don't welcome this kind of zero sum geopolitical competition. Because that gives them a really uh, pose them in such a dilemma, you know they have to take side. Uh, but unfortunately, their economic relationship with China uh, is so uh, close and so dense, uh, and they, 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 there's no substitute for it. The United States cannot replace the role of China in the economic domain. Um, so I see most Asians welcome the possibility that. Uh, on the one hand, uh, U.S. should, you know, uh, contain China uh, as a hedge, but at the same time engage China, you know, to modify and to induce uh, more responsible behavior out of Beijing. 
I think this will be an approach that you know, will bear fruit uh, for the United States in the region. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. I invite other panelists to um, reflect on John's remarks or my question. Yeah, I'll quickly say something about that. So, um, so I really agree that transparency is one thing that we should like counter Chinese disinformation. And uh, back to Larry's questions about uh, uh, Professor Drew's uh, results. I think that really speaks to our research because he mentioned that citizens who support economic globalization have more favorable views of China. And also citizens who perceive the United States as less democratic have more favorable views of China's influence. And in our study that these are the people that they are trying to target because this information can only be affected when it only circulates among certain group of people, like it's like a cult. So if they can target, like they based on their data, trying to collect more private information here in Taiwan, and then they are trying to denounce in the US like along the way, as you can see like over our data, they have been doing this for like two years and then they can really change their views. And they're aiming that people in the middle that I just mentioned about the consumers like different personalities and how they can consume this piece of this information and can really be affected. Any further remarks on uh, John's observations or the question? I have a question for Professor Shun. Uh, specifically, and that is what lessons can we draw from Taiwan's experience with respect to disinformation and propaganda that could apply more broadly throughout liberal democracies? In many ways, Taiwan could be seen as a special case because of its centrality to the PRC and Beijing's agenda in the world and the common language um, that they share. Uh, so I was wondering, and many people hold out the Taiwanese response with respect to fact checking, being extremely quick to counter disinformation, uh, and using technological solutions as well to deprecate particular narratives as something instructive. Do you think those scale well outside of Taiwan and what would you recommend more broadly? I mean, regulation is kind of important because, because we mentioned our democracy and transparency and it's really important that we can flag all this content or their, the, the source of all this disinformation from China. But it's really hard because that you cannot only justify whether it is a Chinese disinformation only based on its content. So uh, our strategy right now is right, uh, we're going to analyze, uh, we're, we're doing that already. So we're trying to analyze their uh, writing style. So different departments and different units there in China have different writing style. So if you compare the writing style and then you can trace the source. And that's how that you, that's something that you could do on the social media platform and try to flag this disinformation have 87 or like 97 similarity writing style of the PLA or United Front Department. And that's one thing we should do. But also where I talk about the collaboration mode, the way they disseminate this information, one way they can do that is they can only pay, they can pay the professors or the students there in that country and trying to ask them to produce the disinformation and then disseminate this information. And, and then we cannot use the writing style methodology to try to trace this kind of, and we need to trace the money flow. And that's another challenge we're facing right now. So just a quick example here, uh, China is trying to collect all of our political talk shows and try to analyze how they talk. And they're using AI to use their voice to read the content generated by the Taiwanese writer there in China. So the writer is in China, the voice in Taiwanese, and then it, there's no there's no other way that we can flag it as the Chinese disinformation. So that's why I think the law that enhanced transparency, like the Foreign Agent Registration, Registration Act could be really play a, plays an important role here if we really want to encounter the Chinese disinformation there. Thank you. Professor Zhu, a question specifically for your data. I was wondering if your survey results, um, particularly with respect to public uh, perceptions towards China and the United States, if you found any deviation between what the general public feels and the policies their governments adopt towards China and the United States, because this would be relevant, of course, to how representative the views of their governments are towards their publics. Well, um, I think by and large, um, the public view and the official policy 
uh, I think they uh, have been uh, gone hand in hand in most countries, like, you know, Japan has always been, you know, uh, very, uh, um, I should say, uh, uh, wary of uh, growing Chinese influence. Uh, the Abe administration, you know, have uh, very much involved in building up the Indochina strategy uh, to contain China, and that pretty much compatible with you know what the sentiment, general sentiment in in, in Japan. But but also we we identify uh, some uh, uh, obvious outlier. Uh, in the case of Myanmar, uh, in Myanmar, the general public still uh, have a very uh, unfavorable view toward China. But Aung San Suu Kyi, her policy actually have, uh, have uh, moved into other direction. Um, so whether, uh, you know, that will, uh, 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 you know, politically that will hurt her uh, or, uh, or she will be able to drag uh, the public opinion uh, to come to, uh, to, to her way. I don't know. Uh, to, uh, uh, present uh, uh, today they, uh, in the Philippines uh, actually uh, have tried to uh, 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 bolster uh, the support uh, for his more uh, accommodating approach toward China. So you see, uh, a slightly uh, upward trend, uh, uh, upward trend, you know, in terms of favorable view toward China, but still, uh, the damage that was uh, have done uh, about eight years ago is still quite, quite strong. So, it, it, you know, to to a limited extent that the, the, the leader can pull the, uh, the public opinion pull with with his own policy or her own policy. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, those comments. I'd like to thank our panelists and John Pomfret uh, for his observations. Uh, they, uh, it was an outstanding session today and we hope that you'll be able to attend the two remaining sessions in this conference, which will meet on Monday and Thursday or if you're in Asia and Oceania, Tuesday and Friday at the same time next week. Our next session is entitled Democracy, Good Governance and Pluralism, and we'll examine the regional competition over the Belt and Road Initiative and the lessons we might draw from Taiwan's experience combating both official corruption and sharp power. I'd also like to alert you to our final panel one week from today in which a stellar cast of experts will take stock at this moment of rising tensions of what China's rise means for the prospects for security and stability in the Indo-Pacific region former national security advisor to the president of the United States, H.R. McMaster, now a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, will open the event with a keynote speech. I thank our panelists. I thank our discussant. I thank you for joining us. See you next time. Mm -hmm.